you so much. Thank for you very much. Be more relevant, and um, you're both going to speak. Well, I'm going to speak very briefly because the real scientist here is to my right. Let me just say that um, we are on the cusp of an incredible scientific and technological revolution in which both China and the United States, largely because of scale, largely because of having the people, the trained personnel, are going to be at the forefront of that. We're not going to monopolize it. Other people from other countries, South Korea, Denmark, where the Beijing Genomics Institute was sort of created in Copenhagen. Uh, but we are really going to be the center of this revolution. And it's going to involve a number of things that today you may not even heard of, but in five years you're going to live by them. One and probably the most important is the quantum computer. Computers today basically work on a binary process, either R, one or zero. They do things in sequence. Now, they do it very fast. Quantum computers, and China has developed one. I have a picture of the head of the team that developed it. A company in Canada has developed one. We've been told that the NSA has developed one, but they're not going to tell us. IBM and Microsoft, both here and in China, are very involved in the development of quantum computers. Because quantum computers will basically do any kind of number of functions and problem solving of very difficult problems involving hundreds of thousands of variables with permutations in the billions, if not trillions. Um, and they do it at incredible speed. A, a quantum computer, when finally developed, will operate at 24,000 times the speed of a, of a present day computer. Imagine that. And it will actually be very small. It's not going to be like the first computer, which I remember, the ENIAC which was in this giant building, or even this one here. And China is very much involved in that. Uh, a scientist in Hefei, which has become sort of the center of scientific and technological development in China, going back to the days of Feng Lichur, uh at an institute there. Uh, and he had gone to school in Vienna. Everything begins in Vienna. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> I, I know why. But anyway, um, he has developed with his team a sort of prototype of that computer. Also, uh, and Dr. Leo will talk more about this, in the area of drug therapy and drug design and development, which again is going to be advanced by supercomputing. And the quantum computer will be the supercomputer of all supercomputers. Uh, what is now almost impossible to do because of all the variations, quantum computers will be able to do it. They'll be able to solve those problems which are now insolvable very important for a uh, design of drugs. In something that you may be familiar with, 3D printing. 3D printing, in which the United States has about 47,000 3D printers, China has about 17,000. 3D printing is making much more simple the process of fabricating an item like this or like this. What now takes a lot of time and a lot of labor power uh, will take a, a much shorter period of time. Building buildings, like the one you're in, are going to become a lot faster. I'm trying to build, I think, a 57-story building in 19 days or something like that. Because they can prefabricate the floors with 3D printing. Uh, and that is going to revolutionize the entire industrial process and perhaps more importantly make everything a lot cheaper. Just as these things are a lot cheaper than those original computers we tried to buy, and a lot smaller. Everything is going to be smaller and cheaper. Uh, China is very much involved, as you probably know, in the development of electric cars. And even though we have people here, where do they get these people, who want to deny electric cars? You know, I, when I'm sitting around working all day, while my mo wife is out teaching biology, I watch CNBC and they spend half their time. You know, I've told them about ten times to interview you, and instead they get. I won't say who, who thinks we're going to have a war with China. Over what? Um, and last time I remember, the war with China wasn't very pleasant. Um, they sit there, oh, you can't have electric cars because of this, because of Nonsense. If you know anything about a Tesla, you know it doesn't have a transmission. It doesn't have an oil system. 
It doesn't have a cooling system. It doesn't need any of that. All it needs is good batteries, which China is also very involved in making, by the same company that makes the electric cars, BYW. Build your dreams. So I see this process that is really going to be revolutionary. Ten years from now, you're not going to recognize your life. It's really going to be transformed by this because, as Steve said, and Deng Xiaoping has said, and others have said, the biggest force for social, political, economic transformation is science and technology. Just think about, I'm old enough to remember how much my life has been changed by these things. Uh, that I can sit in my house and do research that 25, 30 years ago would have required me to travel around the world, go to libraries, go through books like I did when I was writing my dissertation in, in Michigan. Now I can do it sitting looking at this thing. And I can do it in English, I can do it in Chinese, I can do it in a little French I know, um, which is very little. Um, and it's really amazing, and it's just going to get more like that. And China and the United States are both going to be, again, because of scale. No other countries in the world, maybe India in certain respects, but India has other problems, I think. But certainly software, India is very advanced. But China and the United States have the, has the scale, has the personnel, and it has the connections, which I'm glad to say the National Committee has been very much at the forefront of. We have a picture of the first scientific delegation in China. Uh, that you led. And uh, I see this process as largely cooperative. Uh, the case, let's say, of uh, Bill Gates and the China National or State Na uh, Nuclear uh, Power Corporation, they are working on something called the TWR, a traveling wave reactor. Now, without getting into all the specifics here, I warned Margo, I keep the physics to a minimum even though I majored in or minored in physics and other grades. I just loved Einstein. Maybe it was the hair. I don't know. I don't know how many of you watched the National Geographic program on him a few months ago. I like watched it every night. Then I rewatched it. I watched it again. <laughs> I just love that guy. Um, we visited his house in Princeton on Mercer Street. But the traveling wave reactor is going to be basically a reactor that's going to eliminate, sort of like the Tesla does, a lot of stages in the production of power. It's going to be a lot cheaper, and perhaps more importantly, it's going to do it by burning nuclear waste. Now nuclear reactors burn what? They burn U-235. And of course you have to worry about proliferation because U-235 can be used to do something else, which in the 1940s was called the gadget. It was dropped out of an airplane named after the pilot's mother. What does that tell you? Anyway, uh, it's going to use U-238. Well, the world is filled with U-238. Go out to Kansas, they have a, a massive field with nothing but spent fuel rods. And the traveling wave reactor, which will take about 10 years to develop, but Bill Gates is very much, you know, we think of Bill Gates, Microsoft, computers, software, he's really into this. And they just signed a contract about a year and a half ago uh, for, the, uh, for the reactor, the prototype, to be developed in China. He says it's a lot easier in China because the costs are lower, they have the scientists. China's building more nuclear reactors than any country on Earth 23 at the moment. Uh, I think we're building two. And uh, uh, the regulatory process is a lot easier. And so, uh, and keep in mind, China's had no nuclear accident yet. Um, they checked everything out for Fukushima. So that's one example. Another example is SpaceX. Uh, the private company that now is involved very much in the space exploration, which just a few weeks ago launched an experimental package uh, that came from China. As some of you know, NASA is prohibited by law from working with the China National Space Program because of some satellite thing that occurred years ago. I'd like them to get rid of it, but not under this current crowd. You can bet on that. They'll probably strengthen it. Um, and, but uh, uh, Musk, who I also admire, I like these guys that come up with new things, uh, managed to get around the restrictions and launch this back package that went to the International Space Station and is up there doing something actually on uh, genomics research. Uh, how genes, DNA acts under space conditions. And as you may know, we have a Mars program, they have a Mars program, it ain't going to be cheap going to Mars. We'll make it. They'll probably make it. 
But uh, it would be better if we could work together on this. It would be a lot cheaper if we pooled our resources and went to Mars together. They did it in the National Geographic program. They did in the Martian. It's true. <laughs> Remember, the whole thing is saved by the Chinese. <laughs> now, there's a couple problems here, and this is why I have the people up here uh, that you may or may not know. Wu Jianxiong was a nuclear physicist. She actually grew up in rural Jiangsu province, I think. She came to the United States. She was supposed to go to uh, Michigan, <laughs> but she went to Berkeley. And she got her degree, PhD in physics. She actually taught at Columbia. And although you would never know this by watching the movies about the Manhattan Project, named for this island, because it started here, across the apartment from Harriet Mills. She said, we walked out one morning after Pearl Harbor, and there was this metal building with a guard standing outside. We had no idea what was going on. <laughs> they knew on uh, August 6th. And um, she was very much involved in the Manhattan Project. She actually, and I had to read up on this, was very involved in the whole gas diffusion process, which is critical to the production of plutonium. Many have said, she worked with Lawrence at Berkeley, if you know who he is, Lawrence Laboratory. And Lawrence really protected her from a lot of the racist discrimination and sexist discrimination she was running up against there at my Berkeley. Um, and worked on the Manhattan Project, solved a very critical problem, yet if you watch the movies, read the history, She's like, not there. Mm -hmm. The Day After Trinity, a great documentary about the Manhattan Project, mainly about Oppenheimer. Ha! You see any of her pictures? No. Mm -hmm. Fat Man and Little Boy starring Paul Newman. Where is Wu Jianxiang? She's not there playing softball. Uh, and so we have to be aware. You know, people say, well, you know, China for years didn't win a Nobel Prize. Well, that's because they were sort of isolated. They probably had a lot of people that should have. And the people that she worked with, who went to the school that Dr. Leo graduated or got a PhD from, did win the Nobel Prize, but she didn't. The other is a guy named Chen Shui Wen. Now, again, some of you probably know him. He started, you know, on the one hand, we ignore Chinese who've been involved in this process. We're not going to do any more, I think. On the other hand, uh, we treated people like we treated Chen. Chen uh, came here to go to school, went to MIT, got a PhD in physics, uh, taught at Caltech, uh, served with the U.S. Army in Europe to find out whether the Germans had really gotten very close to their gadget, which they didn't. You know, I love it when our enemies are stupid. Hitler once said, there's something Jewish about physics. Thank you, Adolf. I'm glad. Uh, came back to the United States. He helped form the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was one of the founding fathers. He helped design the F-85, which was used uh, in, in, uh, in one of our first gen. And yet, because he has some documents on the way home to China that turned out to be worthless, they didn't contain scientific secrets. He couldn't remove those from his office. <coughs> he was arrested by the FBI, put under house arrest, in which he wrote his greatest book on engineering cybernetics, and deported. Where he went back to China, as you see him in his PLA uniform, from sergeant to PLA commander, he helped develop China's uh, missile program, nuclear weapons program, and later in his life, he lived to be 98, tried to help prevent the uh, march of deserts in western China. So, you know, on the one hand, we ignore, uh, we have in the past, uh, Chinese contributions. In writing this book, I learned about people I never heard of. Their, their contributions were amazing, and they should have won Nobel Prizes. On the other hand, we treated people like we treated Chen because, you know, he, well, we, he was a communist. He was no more communist than I am. Well, um, and then we have people, do we have one up there? Um, go to the next one. Yeah. Whoops. Well, these are some of, that's all right. These, I don't want to take too much time. These are some of the big projects China always likes things big. It's kind of like our president. Um, and, and a lot of these projects will involve a lot of cooperation. One, my favorite, is down in the lower right-hand corner, is the Ping Tong Radio Telescope. If you don't know, radio telescopes, our biggest one is in, uh, the biggest one in the world. It used to be in Puerto Rico. It's now here. This is in Guayaquil. They're the ones that go up and just listen to the sounds. 
if you've seen the movie, uh, I forget what was it, Arrival or something. No, it wasn't Arrival. It was the other one. Uh, you know what a radio telescope does. It doesn't look at things. That's what LAMOS does, which is outside Beijing, also the largest observatory now. Uh, you also see there uh, the Jade Rabbit, uh, so named for a mythical story in China, which was a lunar lander that China managed to accomplish. It stopped functioning after, I think, a few days, but it was accomplished. And they have great designs for putting race, some sort of radar on the moon. And then uh, Mr. Robot, the robots, some of which are like toys, some of which are quite significant. So, you know, I think co cooperation is, is overwhelming, which is good. There's some competition between electric cars, for example. There is a realm of conflict involving, and I won't go into this because of time, cyber warfare, cyber war, uh, security, uh, which I think, based on the little I know, is sort of overblown. It sounds bad, but I think it's just overblown. Uh, we have them building the stealth aircraft. We built the stealth aircraft. They'll probably both be shot down by conventional weapons. But I really see the conflictual side, unlike when I grew up, when everything was, we got to go to war with China. Um, I see that as less important. I think the cooperative side, in good part because of what institutions like the National Committee have done, but also because science is inherently cooperative. I couldn't have written this book with Dr. Leo, without Dr. Leo, I couldn't have written it without the many people who wrote books on Chinese science. Professor Hu Danian at CUNY wrote a book on Albert Einstein in China, a wonderful book. Uh, 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 Garvey from Britain who wrote on China's space project, uh, works on Chinese biology, etc. So it's inherently cooperative. I think, I watched this, and I'll finish with this, I watched this uh, event at Davos where it was Chinese and others talking about China versus the U.S. as a space leader. I think that's an outworn concept. S science is no longer about countries. It's really about cooperative organizations. And, and you know, I can sit here all night, I'm not, I know you don't want to do that, talking about the, 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 the levels of cooperation that Chinese institutions have, both with institutions here in Europe, with South Korea, Japan. It is an international effort. If we're going to really cure cancer, it's going to be a cooperative effort. And I think the Mars project should be cooperative if we can get our act together. I've written my congressman several times on that law. <coughs> Dr. Leo. You wanna? Yeah, no, no, just call this. Okay. I'll answer any questions. Should I continue? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm always uh, envious of Professor Sullivan's stentorian voice. I tend to speak softly, so I, uh, I may, can I, may I uh, present it? Excuse sure. Me standing up. If I speak softly, um, you know, from the back, please let me know. I, I can speak up. Um, it's an honor to be here. And uh, mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, we managed to have found this uh, very invaluable photo yeah. from the, uh, back in the uh, 1973. Yeah. So Premier Zhou Enlai, who uh, back in 1970. In the 70s, 72 exactly, um, he uh, uh, advocated the four modernizations. And back then, China was a buyer, was bareheaded, destitute, and what have you. And so the four modernizations um, uh, was officially announced in 1972. Uh, of the four modernizations, um, China decided to prioritize. And so one of the uh, key prioritizing aspect is uh, modernizing science and technology, which is the foundation of all uh, other sciences. And, but back then, uh, even the late 70s, early 80s, China was still 30, uh, three decades, at least 30, um, three decades behind you know, uh, the uh, pace of development compared to the Western world. And therefore, it was um, imperative for China and Chinese scientists to uh, decide where to start. If you can, um, if you follow the conventional path, you will forever be uh, doing catch up. You will never, uh, you know, uh, sprint ahead. And therefore, uh, the idea of finding niche areas of, uh, was of high importance. And okay, therefore, okay. So my um, uh, portion of the presentation focuses on 
DNA genome, precision medicine or personalized medicine, and uh, uh, you know, based on a, a very um, excellent um, research institute called Beijing Genomics Institute. And I. Which is now located currently. in Shenzhen, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, yeah. the reason why you know, I'm uh, uh, interested in this very topic is uh, uh, related to what I do, actually. So I, um, uh, I worked at Stone Kettering as a scientist for years, and uh, then I relocated to the College of Staten Island, where I ran uh, a small cancer research lab. And therefore, you know, my preferential interest in BGI and how, you know, the, uh, the meaningful and influential projects there involving genome <coughs> and precision medicine. So, uh, I've decided to include uh, this foundation slide. Uh, it talks about cells and genes and DNA, sort of to lay uh, the, the framework. I'll go slowly and stop me. Uh, it's actually, I should be, it's very logical to follow. So basically, you start with a cell. Here's a mammalian cell with a, a nucleus. That's where all the genetic information is housed. And that's, okay. And so the collections of the genetic material, uh, ultimately it's uh, um, presented in the form of chromosomes. And, okay, and you have the collective structure. The DNA by itself, if it's a linear, it's going to stretch from here to, um, uh, to the moon seven times, and therefore you need a uh, device a way to uh, organize it. So the organization part um, uh, comes from the uh, histone. So histones are proteins, pretty much like uh, you imagine a thread, like a roll, a roll of thread. Without the roller, it's going to be messy. And but with the roller, and the roller uh, is the same function of histone. So with the histone, you basically you wrap DNA strands around. And, um, and, and you can organize, all of the DNAs are organized in the uh, 46 uh, chromosomes, 23 pairs, as for organization. Okay, so, so what is gene? So collectively you have, so gene, genes are essentially um, specific segments carved out from these long strips of DNA strands. And depending on how it's carved out, it's going to um, function uh, differently. Uh, at the uh, cellular level, and and of course you have the uh, the building blocks of DNA, which they're called the fancy term is nucleotide, and basically they're just four building blocks. Um, of all the uh, three billion pairs of uh, uh, base pairs of uh, human uh, genome, only four building blocks, and that the it suffices to uh, to. Uh, all the biological uh, activity. Okay, so the four uh, building blocks, they have fancy names, so for purposes of, uh, you know, simplification. So it's basically, it's a, a, a abbreviated AT and GC. So the pairing is of high importance. This will bring um, upon the uh, significance of uh, genome sequencing. And, okay, so the pairing, uh, the four blocks we mentioned is for it's AT or GC. But the pairing is very uh, specific because A is always paired with a T and vice versa, and C is always paired with a G, vice versa. And anything happens. So for instance, this uh, position is supposed to be a C. If instead of a C, it is replaced by a T, that's very bad news. And this in, um, uh, the field of biology, we call that, that's a point mutation, right? because of one uh, uh, base difference. And that difference is going to uh, have an impact on the gene. Depending on the type of gene, if it's a gene that regulates cell growth, that's going to be of high relevance. How? Because the mutation would lead to uncontrolled cell growth. And cumulative cell growth out of control over time, tumor. Okay, so this is an, an image showing a, a glioblastoma, or blessings for uh, Senator McCain. Um, so, suppose a patient arrives at the uh, physician's office uh, diagnosed with uh, glioblastoma. How would you uh, design a treatment strategy? Um, you have to go to the basics. So, you need to know 
you need to design a strategy that kills only cancer cells but spare healthy cells. Otherwise, it would defeat the purpose. And to do that, you need to uh, know the basics. And the basics go back to the four building blocks. You have AT and GC. So there are specific mutations associated with different types of cancers. So for instance, glioblastoma would uh, be associated with very specific type of point mutation or other types of mutation. And the um, complicated aspect of cancer and cancer treatment is the same glioblastoma diagnosed in Senator McCain may not be the same by another patient, by S uh, Senator Kennedy. 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 Why? Because in individuals have a different mutational background. And, um, but the take home message here, to know the exact DNA sequence and where and how uh, things go awry would uh, provide direct relevance uh, for designing uh, drugs and you know, tailored to uh, the individual <coughs> patient. Am I going too fast? Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, we're back to BGI. So BGI, uh, uh, named Beijing Genomics Institute. So this was the product of, um, uh, the human genome product was officially started in 1990, and it was US, of course, UK, France, and Japan. And so Chinese scientists, looking at the, we have 1.1 billion people, and none of the, our scientists deserve uh, uh, you know, any positions in this project. So they um, uh, um, decided to apply officially. And the um, uh, uh, <coughs> genome committee came back saying that uh, China is a, under a specific system, uh, the organization involved in the genome sequencing cannot be government run. So it has to be a non, an NGO organization. And therefore, these uh, uh, a small group of scientists, they got together. They actually uh, persuaded the Chinese government to allow them to set up the NGO. And because of this effort, Chinese scientists uh, were able to obtain 1% of the human genome project. And so this was uh, uh, the founding um, president of BGI, uh, Dr. Yang, who actually was um, trained, uh, received his PhD in biochemistry in um, Washi Washi Washington University. Oh, in St. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. No. University of Washington. Washington, Washington. Uh, and, okay, so, so BGI, uh, since its family was uh, started in Beijing, then moved to Jiangsu, I suppose, and eventually uh, settled down in Shenzhen. And uh, they made great uh, efforts in um, contributing to uh, uh, part of the effort to uh, solve the, the SARS uh, crisis. And so Dr. Yang uh, received his PhD, but he did his uh, postdoc training in biochemistry at Harvard University. And another luminary uh, from uh, uh, the field of biology from originally Harvard University was this gentleman, the scientist, Dr. James Watson. Uh, any of you who's unfamiliar with James Watson is responsible. He, he made possible for the human genome sequencing because he's the one, along with um, his uh, co-scientist um, from the UK, uh, identified uh, the DNA structure, the double helix structure. And so we have a great mind. Uh, I think he received the Nobel Prize in 1953. And uh, some 40 decades later, the two minds met. And so Dr. Yan <coughs> approached uh, Dr. Watson um, because BGI really um, highly appreciates the, uh, the educational slash research um, structure established at Cochrane Harbor Laboratory where um, Every year they have this traditional um, uh, uh, conference series where they uh, uh, house you know, um, all the uh, brid uh, brilliant minds of uh, all biological fields from the, all over the world. And therefore they met and the product of their conversation was very successful and they um, established the, the BGI uh, organized Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Asia. This was in a very beautiful uh, setting in uh, Jiangsu province. Oh. Okay, and, and you see the four building blocks right there. Okay. So BGI um, uh, realized that um, it, it takes a village. Uh, BGI alone cannot uh, do, do the trick. And therefore, um, 2010 BGI um, opened up its uh, uh, North America headquarter uh, in uh, Cambridge, Mass. And 
Soon after that, BGI made a, a great contribution to the uh, uh, human uh, another human health crisis crisis in uh, Germany. This is a highly uh, uh, antibiotic resistant E. coli strain, and BGI's successful sequencing um, identified um, the strain uh, in a timely fashion and saved uh, you know thousands of lives. And so BGI um, is getting even more ambitious, um, but not just for ambitious sake, but uh, BGI in 2013 collected a uh, one of the um, uh, two major U.S.-based genome sequencing uh, biotech companies. This one is called uh, Complete Genomics, located in the bucolic uh, Mountain View, California, for 118 billion yeah. uh, million dollars, and therefore you have the establishment of BGI Complete Genomics um, today. So BGI, uh, in addition to, in parallel to its uh, collaborative effort, is also uh, very proactively involved in sequencing of various genomes that goes beyond human, around from panda bear, uh, red sorghum, soybean, uh, bok choy, uh, alligator, and so on and so forth. And um, I only have one comment about BGI. In, these are all, uh, you know, they all serve uh, functional purposes. But I think recent years, BGI, uh, for whatever reason, they've decided to also get involved in sequencing and identifying the quote-unquote genius genes, <laughs> which is subject to a huge debate because uh, it's not, uh, the gene is not just um, genetic, but also psychological, environmental, and then that, the, um, the latter two factors are very hard to control. Uh, anyway, so. Um, just as long as they don't build a Terminator. <laughs> So uh, genome sequencing uh, was uh, one of the uh, niche areas that uh, Chinese government and scientists decided to get involved and was very successful so far. Another, um, I wouldn't call this niche because um, it's just like, uh, I think it was a conversation years ago, uh, a few, forgive me, Westerners uh, were making a comment about Chinese medicine saying, oh, that's alternative medicine, can we trust that? And the answer is, Chinese medicine has been around for more than 5,000 years. How can it be alternative, right? It should be the primary. Uh, but that's a side comment. So here's a successful story of kind of uh, digging, uh, reaching out for the, the, the uh, treasure from the old box, you know, dust of the dust, and it's, you know, the treasure is still treasure. So this was um, uh, the, uh, the famed Ben San Gao Mu, right? It's the, uh, the Chinese uh, herbal uh, encyclopedia information extracted would point to specific plants, um, roots, stem, leaves, what have you. <coughs> you extract it, you have you know, complex processing, um, and eventually you extract the uh, active ingredient. And so this actually, if I just show this, you say, ah, the Chinese way, they're still uh, the old fashioned. Actually, this was, um, I have a, a colleague who uh, comes from, um, years of uh, experience working for one of the major farmers here, uh, you know, uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies. So what pharmaceutical companies, how do they design, say, cancer drugs? You can't do anything from scratch, um, you know, based on the organic chemistry. You have to uh, rely on what's existing. So um, these big farmers, they have these, call it uh, treasure hunting teams. Uh, they are sent to all over the world, to the Amazon, to uh, the jungles in uh, Southeast Asia, they look through old folklore books. They mm -hmm. talk to great grandmothers, say, what's, 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 the, what's the leaf that, you know, we use for it, uh, to treat inflammation? And so this was, um, you know, uh, a conventional way. So a successful story that came out of this uh, trend uh, or line of niche, if you will, is uh, the very uh, uh, 2015, I still remember that day, I was, uh, I woke up and my husband was, uh, I'm the worst, I'm not the best driver, so my husband was driving me to my college where I was going to teach, and uh, so, uh, uh, great announcement, finally, Chinese uh, can claim a Nobel laureate in natural science of somebody born <coughs> and raised, uh, a scientist homemade, so I said, we do have Xian Yang, but he was educated here and became a U.S. citizen. And so this was a huge, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of an encouragement that's an understatement. Um, I have a little vignette about this. So what happened is, uh, yeah, okay. 
So uh, Dr. Tu was one of uh, multiple parallel teams. It was um, uh, in, during the Vietnam War, actually. So oh. Ho Chi Minh paid a visit <coughs> to Chairman Mao, begging him to please help us find a drug that cures malaria. And you see, what happened to the, the existing drug? So there's a new strain that's antibiotic resistant. And so Mao responded right away, established um, uh, Chinese military still, you know, the most efficient uh, uh, troops. So uh, Dr. Tu um, uh, was uh, one of, uh, from one of these institutes that's uh, regulated under the military. And so there are actually three parallel groups. Uh, they work simultaneously and supposedly um, whether the final result came from one group or uh, com com combined effort, uh, the, uh, the three groups are involved at least, right? So um, before the Nobel Prize um, decision, there is a US um, scientific award. It's called the Lasker Award, it's actually. And that's uh, considered as a, a very good predictor for Nobel. So the Lasker Committee got together and they, ha they, uh, they had a list of three candidates. Dr. Tu was one of them. There were two other gentlemen. And they all work on the same project. And I think it's the 521 <coughs> uh, project. So the committee was at, um, you know, was frustrated in what we can only name one scientist. And so they thought and thought. Finally, they came up with an idea. So they um, asked individual scientists, they say, if you were to nominate one, you would nominate yourself, right? And the answer is yes. And not surprisingly, the second question is, if you were to uh, nominate the second one other than you, whom would you nominate? And the other two gentlemen both nominate Dr. Tu, and therefore, um, but uh, still China, um, China's uh, pride, uh, for sure. Actually, this is a true story. So Dr. Tu, after um, uh, identified the uh, active ingredient from the, um, the uh, plant I showed you, called Art artemisinin, she actually infected herself with malaria. And she, she treated it with the drug, and she was cured. And that is, that speaks of volume, right? Um, how, much more, how much more time in your presentation? Yeah, Because we want to leave time for discussion. Sure, sure. Oh, okay. Okay, so as China uh, very efficiently advancing along the path of uh, greater you know, scientific discovery, there's also the, uh, uh, the effort to, uh, to keep Chinese scientists in where they are. So one of the effort, it was here, uh, was the Chinese version of the Nobel Prize. It was an uh, uh, NGO, a uh, very uh, lucrative amount. Uh, shown here are the scientific uh, <coughs> committee uh, deciding. So I want to mention these three scientists. Uh, Dr. Uh, Xu, who um, uh, a few years ago decided to give up his tenure position at Princeton University and return to Tsinghua University. And second, uh, Dr. Pan, uh, uh, nuclear um, physicist and uh, mathematician. Those are the three winners of the, of the uh, first 2017 one. So the effort to um, uh, recruit Chinese scientists back home is uh, ongoing. And um, Professor Sandman and I were actually uh, interviewed by the New York Times reporter over the weekend about this very uh, subject matter. See, one, you have the uh, high grades to return home from the sea. And starting from the 1950s, you have the famed uh, Dr. Qian Xiexun, nuclear physicist, followed by um, the, uh, the Yangtze River Scholars Project, and uh, <coughs> then the 1000 Talent Project, and till um, now it has been, uh, there have been 10 uh, cohorts of, for this project, so you know, attracting thousands of uh, scientists back home. And those three are included, and the most recent mm -hmm. one was this uh, uh, Dr. Xu, uh, chief scientific officer of Amazon, uh, successfully persuaded by Jack Ma to now work for Alibaba. <laughs> and now you have uh, uh, the president, President Xi, really, not only uh, a uh, chemical engineer himself, but also you know, uh, pays uh, close attention to uh, science and scientists. And on the other hand, you have the other effort for the U.S. to uh, attract Chinese uh, brilliant scientists uh, uh, back to the U.S. So here's an, an example of a uh, Princeton-trained uh, Chinese structural biologist who recently decided to leave Tsinghua University and settled in uh, Princeton, back home. Um, 
So what's the, uh, I think it's a two-way street. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the future of science and scientists should be uh, of a um, globalization. And really, because it takes a village, uh, whether in biological science and uh, other uh, areas. So back to, I want to uh, conclude with about, um, the BGI. Uh, in terms of uh, US-China uh, collaboration, cooperation uh, with uh, complete genomics, uh, Cambridge Mass, uh, with Coldstream Harbor Laboratory, and um, BGI is also working very, very closely. So there are 21 uh, big farmers in the whole world, and BGI is supposedly working collaboratively with 17 out of the 21. And what's the purpose? So we, we, I started out with the Chinese, um, uh, the government scientists deciding to find a niche area. But the niche area is not just for the sake of working on something new, something easy to catch up, but uh, rather um, it must serve a purpose, uh, a meaning. So what's that meaning? And the meaning, I think, the collective. So all the uh, thousands, billions of uh, base pair sequenced by BGI ultimately serves um, for a collective need. That is to, uh, from a personal perspective, to really provide patient-specific yeah. genome data uh, to repurpose old drugs, and we can design new ones. And ultimately, it's for the purpose of designing personalized medicine tailored to individual uh, patients, including our uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Senator McCain. So I'd like to in conclude this by uh, saying that I mentioned I run a, a a small lab, uh, we focus on uh, glioblastoma specifically at the College of Staten Island. And as I mentioned, it takes a village. And uh, so uh, we work very closely with collaborators at uh, Sloan Kettering. And with that, thank you very much. And thank you. Let, let me just see if I could add one little thing. Uh, Dr. Tu and her anti-malaria drug, and, drug, and having just read a book on the construction of the Panama Canal and found out that most of the people who died in the process died of either malaria or yellow fever. Uh, they weren't killed by work accidents. Uh, and Richard and I were talking about China and Africa, where malaria is still a problem. She is probably responsible for saving more people than just about anybody you can think of by developing that anti-malaria drug. And uh, she's a very simple person. She, the day after she got the Nobel Prize, she says, I have to work in my lab. She has a lot of her plants and things in her own apartment. And even though he's often seen as anti-scientific, which in many ways he was, she says, well, I was motivated to do this originally by Mao Zedong. Who also, by the way, came up with the idea with Joe and Lai of the Moon Project. <coughs> anyway, question. Sure. The co so the co I mean, you're obviously said supporting kind of collaboration between the United States and China. And BGI is an example of that. Most of the BGI senior staff is American trained. It's Chinese yep. mm -hmm. who came to the United yeah. States and mm -hmm. now have returned. One, by the way, question is how much of, not really a U.S.-China relations question, well, a little bit, but how much of that was driven by a decision by the U.S. government to stop during the George W. Bush administration, which is when BGI was founded, yeah. to stop funding fetal tissue research? So that, that that's one question. And, and then that's, you know, were they driven to, to is, to the, were they driven to China? Were they driven to Israel? Because they were actually losing their research funding here. That's one question. The second is, how much, how much is, you know, Lars mentioned it, how much is this collaboration inhibited by you, the U.S. government? How much of it is fostered by the U.S. government, and how much of it is inhibited by the U.S. government? And, and take NAS NASA out of it, right. because NASA, obviously, it's entirely inhibited, and we know that it's a terrible law, but it is what it is. Well, let me add, I don't know about the, uh, the biological side, but my sense is that this is really, what's important here is the emergence of the private sector. 
30, 40 years ago when we became interested in China, it was all about what the U.S. government was going to do, what the Chinese government was going to do. That was it. But now you have private firms like SpaceX, uh, like Bill Gates, and even though, you know, he, it wasn't any law that prevented him from starting up TWR in China. It was that China had been more involved in building nuclear reactors than we have for a number of reasons. Three Mile Island, which I can remember walking around Cambridge the day that it happened thinking, how long do we have? Uh, <laughs> Fukushima later. Uh, but China has been very good in, in that area and was not spooked by Fukushima. Of course, they did a total review of their nuclear reactors to make sure they were safe, and fortunately none of them are located on the ocean in an earthquake and tsunami prone area. Um, so I see the rise of the private sector. I don't care who's president, who controls Congress. <coughs> to me, the real difference here from 30 years ago is that so much of this is now private sector. A BGI operates largely by dealing with private companies. Whether the Congress allocates less or more money to genomic research and biological research is sort of irrelevant because so much of it is done by corporations. And so here I think the private sector has been absolutely instrumental and will probably be even more instrumental. I mean, who would have thought when we watched Alan Shepard go up and John Glenn that there would someday be a private company that would be engaged in this? And now they're building the world's biggest rocket. The feudal thing, I don't know. To what extent was that a factor? Um, no, I think it's a good question. Um, so uh, you talk about feed and uh, stem cell research. Right. So that's, uh, I would say that's part of it, but that's uh, not all of it. Um, part of it um, is uh, that, uh, so s stem cell research um, can be done by multiple means uh, other than rely on feeders. Uh, there's a new technology that's de developed that you can uh, extract uh, stem cells from adult skin, skin cells. So, uh, but uh, to follow up on your question, uh, part of the um, uh, Chinese going back home is uh, driven by uh, policy. So uh, there's this um, uh, uh, very promising uh, cancer therapy is called P53 therapy. So P53 is a classic uh, tumor suppressor gene and it's found to be not expressed, you know, very, very low expression level in uh, most cancer um, patients. So the, uh, the therapy uh, works on the mechanism of uh, provide infusing a lot of P53 proteins to the pa cancer patients with the goal, you know, of uh, uh, killing cancer cells. But the P53, so the P53 um, strategy was developed by a pair of scientists, a U.S. Uh, citizen scientist and a Chinese scientist, they work as a team. And so they develop a therapy, testing in mice, very successful, apply for FDA approval, they wait, they wait, they waited, they waited, they're still waiting. It's still not proved, uh, approved by FDA. So the Chinese scientist finally, he could not wait anymore. Mm -hmm. He packed up, he went back home, he established a very successful P53 clinic in Beijing and in Shenzhen. And so, you know, from their website, you know, they have patients from all over the world going and the CFDA for treatment. approved it? Not yet. The no, CF, but the so the CFDA has, so the US oh, yes. FDA has yes. CFDA, yes. CFDA, of course. CFDA mm -hmm. China. Of China, course. They yes. did approve it. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, uh, the, the, their, their approvals are, you know, the C, we, we, we're doing work yeah. with mm -hmm. CFDA mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. and on a US China healthcare dialogue. Uh -huh. Their approval process is often problematic for Western mm. companies. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So some of the pharma that gets approved mm. in the U.S., Europe, and Japan mm. has a tough time getting mm. approved in China. Uh -huh. um, but mm -hmm. the, the main, main reasons for probably improved uh, for this kind of Chinese and um, medicines, uh, I was I was told that's a lot of you know when it can be. They have this kind of, you know, technologies and the medicine uh, is based on the herb, uh, you know, Chinese. Mm -hmm. They, but this is this isn't this is a cancer treatment that's not related to China. 
the Chinese medicine, right? Yeah, this is just this a... Is the, yes. Okay, uh, the standard mm -hmm. Western. So uh, up to now, the Chinese and uh, the applications for uh, the FDA mm. is not uh, up to no uh, cases to be approved. You say you're see. talking about Chinese herbal medicine? Yeah, yeah. Approving by FDA would be very difficult. Very difficult. Very difficult because the, China, the nature of Chinese herbal medicine is it's a compound, <coughs> compound of multiple uh, molecules. And uh, first of all, it's kind of a, I wouldn't say anti, but it's not uh, in line with the, uh, the, the philosophy of yeah. Western medicine. You, you go after the most active ingredient. And so um, uh, of the many compounds, um, some of them are being tested in uh, mice, um, laboratory um, it or, uh, uh, or patient volunteers, <coughs> most of them have not. So you, it's a bit too complicated to really to assess the uh, patient safety. So I would say- The, clini the clinical yeah. studies that the US FDA yeah. requires mm -hmm. are very different, are rarely done for Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. so, so they just, it's exactly what Dr. Leo said, it's, it's thousands of years. Yeah. And they Philosophy believe th and the they culture. believe that that it works. Yeah. Yeah. And when you talk to the you know the, the Chinese FDA, they said <coughs> it, it it's it will doesn't qualify under kind of your Western standards because yeah. mm -hmm. the clinical studies are never there. But it's a belief system in China yeah. that it's simply a belief system. And if you believe if Xi Jinping believes in it. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I do. You I do, do too. Yeah. Oh yeah, I had picked up intestinal parasites in Southeast Asia, yeah. which you don't want to get. And I was, you know, I took all this quote unquote Western medicine. <laughs> I think it made it worse, not better. And I was in Taiwan and going crazy and I was taken to a Chinese traditional medicine hospital there and they gave me the stuff which I lived by for years until it finally just went away and it was great yeah. I, 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 I could be laid up for two or three straight days I mean yeah. running to the bathroom and this stuff I took it and I'm out on the street jogging 36 hours later yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah. but you know I came here the only place I could buy it was in Chinatown you couldn't get it anywhere else I, I pleaded I once played golf with a drug executive or CVS executive and said, <laughs> why don't you make this stuff right. available at your store? It works. We're not interested. Yeah. They could never get it. Well, you can get it approved as a, as a supplement. Yeah. Well, there's no approval to supplement. It's mm -hmm. a supplement. But how many people have experienced, how many people take Chinese medicine in this room? So virtually everyone. Yeah. But this is a China crowd. Because <laughs> I, ha I had the exact, but, but if it were I had the exact same experience yeah. when I lived in Taiwan. I got an intestinal bug. I was so sick. Yeah. I there was a Seventh Day Adventist hospital that treated Westerners, so I went there. They gave me all the all this stuff, and I never had a lot of excess weight, so I was just getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So one day I'm waiting for the bus, and I'm literally holding. I'm so weak. I'm like holding on to the oh. pole. And it was in front of a pharmacy. Uh -huh. and the pharmacy, very friendly. Lot, there were four foreigners <laughs> living in this whole 500,000 person place. So he says, you know, what's wrong? And I said, my stomach. And he looks at me and he takes my pulse. And he goes, ah, I've just got the medicine for you. And there, you know, they have those snakes in, mm, yeah. you know, in decomposing yeah. snakes. Yeah. So he takes a part of the decomposing Ooh. snake. <laughs> and then he had a frog. <laughs> and and, and he, this wasn't meant for He then oh. took him. He, he put them in a mortar mm. and pestle. Yeah. He yeah. mashed them in front of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. put them in, in and I was so sick, I was in heaven that he was doing it. So, <laughs> so he did it, I took it, and I was better mm. in 48 hours. Yeah. And I've never had a intestinal. But the problem was I no more intestines. I the, pro <laughs> the problem with CVS is not the FDA. The problem with CVS is CVS. You go there, we were just there because I had forgotten to take my asthma medicine, and I need to have it all the time. And you can't find anything made in China. And I'm like, well, what, you know, why? I asked the guy, like, why won't you buy this stuff? Here, I'll give you a sample. You can buy, go to Chinatown, buy and put it on your, he wouldn't do it. Yeah. He would not. Well, that's Chinese medicine. So? 
What can I say? <laughs> Anybody else have some questions that they'd like to ask? Over here. A couple of questions, Robert. Yeah, oh, Richard. Uh, Xi Jinping has talked a lot in the last week about uh, an orientation around the innovation economy, mm -hmm. meaning that the role of science uh, and economy inter intersect. Yes. Uh, as scientists, uh, what is your take on that? Because this is a traditional American approach, whether you're thinking about Hamilton, yeah. Ford on manufacturers, or Thomas yeah. Edison, or Ford. Yeah. So what, currently, do you, how do you see the intersection between the support of science in China and the economic miracle, which more and more people are admitting? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think it's the private sector. I mean, thank God for the private sector. I'm sorry for sounding like CNBC, but <laughs> uh, Andrew Sorkin is a good friend of mine. Um, I think it's the private sector that sees that. Most private sector people are concerned about what's going to work, what's going to sell. And I just don't see the inability. I mean, I worked in Congress for years, or not for years, but worked in Congress for a while. And getting Congress to do anything that involved China at the time was just like, it's like pulling your hair out. And I don't detect that among the private sector people. Elon Musk is not pulling his hair out about building a factory in Shanghai. He wants to do it. The question is whether he can get the permission from China to do it. But he will build a factory in Shanghai. And uh, he's not, you know, he really wanted to put that experimental package up. He wished he could do more if we get rid of that stupid law. So I think, uh, and there are people in Congress, I think, who understand this, that, uh, you know, level of cooperation with BGI. Yeah, keep in mind, Dr. Leo didn't mention it, there's a company in San Diego, which I have no own stock in, <laughs> uh, which sells the machines that they do the gene sequencing on. And they ain't cheap. They're what, $10 million each, something like that? Whoa. No, it's being reduced. Uh, and who's the biggest buyer of those machines in the world? China. Guess. BGI. BGI. BGI has more of the, the company's called Illumina. I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A. And Illumina sells, has sold more of those machines to BGI than the rest of the world combined. We have places, a few universities, a few of our pharmaceutical companies that have bought them, but I think, what do they have, like 150, something like that? Their, their uh, operation in Shenzhen, which is in an old shoe factory, is just huge. It's massive. Uh, and they're very young. Uh, even young is not that old, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I see, the, you know, the, the private sector is really the mover and shaker in this. Um, you bring in politics, you bring in government, uh, you get all you get all these things. People worrying about it. does this create jobs or whatever, and it all sort of gets muddled. I mean, I worked in Congress for a while. <laughs> I've had enough of this. I'm going back to academia. Let's go to some other questions. Which, anyway, Robert, sure. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, just today we had this bill that's been announced in Congress uh, about strengthening the CCS process and uh, tightening scrutiny. And uh, your, your, your feeling about this uh, Chinese espionage is kind of overblown, but it seems like there's momentum gathering, especially uh, based on this document that came out from the uh, Defense Department called China's Technology Transfer Strategy. Right, I know. <coughs> uh, you know those documents, yeah. So uh, a lot of uh, lawmakers, policymakers are acting on this, and I'm just wondering, do you think, that based on your experience in Congress, is this just something that's going to blow over, or is this going to Well, at the time I was in Congress, we weren't doing this. Uh, we were figuring out how to get small arms to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Have Actually, you seen the document? Because it seems like... I've, I read it. about it. I didn't... Right. I, mean, uh, it, I, I will look it, at it. It obviously. alleges a very multi-layered... Well, you know, my I, I sort of feel like the way Bill Gates does. You know, everybody was complaining that you went to China and you saw all this Microsoft software on the street that had been pirated. And, and he estimated, I think, at one time that it cost him $800 million or something like that. But he said in the end, he sort of was glad they did that because now with open sourcing and all that, he knows they have the foundation. And actually, they made the new versions of Microsoft available to the people who bought the pirated versions. So I, you know, I'm... 
this is just my own view. I, I tend to be rather cynical on these things. So much of this stuff in Congress is done on, uh, for what purpose? Usually political. Right now, bashing China is, is sort of, you know, we, uh, is in vogue. And every time something comes up, they, they see it as endemic to the U.S.-China relationship, which I think is generally overblown, uh, particularly when you look at the amount of Chinese investment in states like Alabama and places like that where they're uh, setting up factories. In some cases, yes, I know there's been a pirating of, of things, but let me tell you, folks, I, I know enough about American companies since I actually spend much of my time playing the stock market that we aren't exactly, you know, <coughs> beneath that. Uh, we don't particularly want to admit it, but it's there, and it's from European companies. I've talked to European CEOs that all they do is yell and scream about whom? Us! Um, and as I was talking to Richard beforehand, keep in mind, Apple Computer got the graphic interface given to it by Xerox. Now they gave it to them. Because Xerox said, you think we're really going to produce something called a mouse? Uh, and, you know, the rest is history. But I, I just, you know, I'm very cynical about what goes on in, in Washington. I mean, uh, did you work in Congress? In the State Department. Oh, you were in the State Department. Under whom? Carter. Oh, but not President. Who was the Secretary of State? Vance. Vance. Oh, yeah. And Kissinger for... Uh, well, your Guy Vance. Green, who I believe you had here, has written a very good yeah. book on yeah, that. Right. I, I think that report, which hasn't been subject to a lot of scrutiny... Yeah, yeah. subject to a lot of scrutiny. There was that it was released and then it was withdrawn. Oh really? Yes. <coughs> and who produces the Pentagon? The Department of Defense has a unit called um, called Defense Innovation Unit Experiment, D I U X. Yeah. But they're um, first I would say in terms of <coughs> getting legislation through yeah. Um, they can't. So far, the Congress hasn't demonstrated that they're important <laughs> legislation. Thank goodness. Through. This is bipartisan, though. It's John mm -hmm. Cornyn and Diane I, Feinstein. I, I, I've mm. seen that. Um, the, it still requires the speaker and the leader to mm. kind of get behind it. And if it affects companies. Very, they've got a very yeah. um, full legislative agenda. And if it affects companies, they're going to come yelling and screaming. Second, the CFIUS, or yeah. CFIUS procedure actually works pretty well. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty objective process yeah. which takes into account national security. Yeah. And it kind of, there. if we put in place rules which <coughs> take into account things other than national security, so a lot of countries do. Yeah. Economic oh, yeah. security, they protect oh, yeah. national champions. Oh, yeah. The Chinese do. Yeah. So, but it devalues every asset yep. in the United States that once you tell someone, so if you, like what we did with um, <coughs> Humacal, yep. and everybody said, who was the loser? It's a question I always ask. That Chevron bought Humacal rather than CNOOC, who lost? Right. Who was the biggest loser? Yeah. Mm. People say CNOOC. Not really. You know who the biggest loser was? California teachers. And people look at me, they go, California teachers? What are you, smoking dope? <laughs> Why do California teachers? Because the retirement fund for California yeah. teachers was the largest investor in, Calper. in Unical. Yeah. Yeah. So they got, you know, the price they paid was about $3 billion yeah. less. Yeah. So that was three billion dollars. Yeah. Obviously, it wasn't a hundred percent, but it was three billion dollars yeah. less for the various pension yeah. funds that owned Unical. So the losers really were retirees and people. When you talk to congressmen about it, they kind of get it, yeah. and they, they realize there's huge risk because when there is a national security issue in investment, CFIUS deals yeah. work pretty well. It's like the CBO. It's the same sort of you know. They're not partisan, they, and they and it's expertise. They, by the way, were involved in nixing 
the effort by Chinese company by KUKA. I don't know if anybody here knows who KUKA is. KUKA is the largest producer of industrial robots in Germany. Oh, yeah. And there's like three or four German companies. And Xi Jinping has said, we want all the robots we can. Foxconn says it's going to buy a million robots for its factories worldwide. The biggest producer, by the way, is in Switzerland. Yeah. Well, Steve, counter to that uh, Unicell story is uh, uh, MagnaCoin uh, getting sold uh, to the Chinese and then the processing for uh, refining rare earth uh, elements into, uh, into uh, their usable state from the United States. The whole plant was taken lock, stock, and barrel uh, over to China. It's rare, is it rare earth? Rare earth. Yeah. 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 Magnaplant was a division of General Motors. Yeah. It was uh, sold out. Uh, and um, none other than uh, uh, Archibald Cox Jr. was uh, in charge of that uh -huh. firm, and he ended up selling it to the Chinese. Uh -huh. And we lost all of our ability in terms of intellectual property, uh, as well as native uh, ability to, uh, to uh, process rare earth elements. But China still sells us a lot of rare earths. Yeah, They're a they major do. provider. I think they do, yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. In fact, they, I, I, I have a... You'll recall, sure. not so long ago, five years, uh, a, a problem when China stopped selling the world. Yeah. Uh, Japan and the United yeah. States primarily. Yeah. Uh, rare earth. Yeah, and a, a Chinese economist, I forget his name right now, complained about 15 years ago that they weren't charging enough for the rare earths that they were selling, and there's a lot of rare earths, I can tell you, in this thing, mm -hmm. that they weren't charging enough and China wasn't making enough money on the rare earths that they were selling. Uh, but there are a lot of rare earths in China. There are other places. Africa has a lot of rare earths. They haven't been developed as much as they should. So what happened, Gene, is though that the ultimately <coughs> so the Chinese kind of took control of the market, right. then the, because of that, alternative sources developed, the price fell through the floor, and there were a lot of people who <coughs> went out of business. Yes. So Absolutely. it was going to close. And last, last question. Oh, we got oh. three questions. Uh oh, real quick. Real quick. Three in a row, because then we got to wrap it up. Yeah. No, I know. Exactly, you can't really, it's all intertwined. Exactly. You can. mm -hmm. I think BGI, she's uh, 10, 100, 10, 10 million dollars mm -hmm. right, yeah. uh, from the uh, construction yeah. bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good for them. <laughs> I was going <coughs> to ask if you are familiar with Innovation City in Wuhan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're working with Dr. Wong, who's uh -huh. back from Stanford University. Oh, yeah? on microbiolytic medical mm -hmm. and non-medical equipment that's manufactured in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. And the Chinese have made a, I shouldn't say it that way, it was suggested that we become a Chinese company, a joint venture, to get through the Chinese FDA. Right. I'm just looking to see if it's in the dictionary. No, I'm familiar with that. Um, I mean, when I spoke of private sector, I meant basically what's going on in the United States. I have argued somewhat subjectively that I don't think there's anything like a pure private company in China. Maybe Alibaba, I don't know. But, they're, 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 we, they're, 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 you know, it's all like this. It's all like this, but so what? I mean, you know, 
we drive to I drive to CSI every other day. We go by the Verrazano Narrow Bridge, and we see these ships go by with twenty thousand containers on them, barely making it under the bridge. And Hat Pack Lloyd, which is a big, it's quarter owned by the government of the state of Hess, so <laughs> still carrying containers. I, uh, this government economic, you know, the quotes of, of, uh, of Hamilton and all manufacturers. He wasn't just talking about the private economy. He was talking about what the U.S. government was going to do. Why do we, you know, it drives me up the wall when I hear Joe Kernan talk about in the morning, see what time I get up, about the private sector and I, uh, developing Intel. Uh-uh. Intel could not sell a chip in the first five years of its existence, it's up to one buyer. And who was that? The United States Air Force. Because they needed the chips to reduce the weight of, nu of, of missiles. Private sector in the country was not buying the chips. They would have gone out of business. Maybe this wouldn't be here. So none of that, I, I see that as, I don't care who BGI gets the money from. If they cure cancer, I don't think we're going to be saying, well, I'm not going to take that drug because it was because it was developed by a government-sponsored Stanford University. The, the, the government of the United States was very involved in that computer center, yeah. which is still the center of a lot of world research. Yeah. So, by the, German, the way, when... The German uh, government has invested a million euros yeah. in the research yeah. this equipment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, good. I speak Chinese because of the U.S. government. So do I. Yeah. You speak so, Yours is better. Yeah. I just want to add, when Last Steve words. Jobs had his um, uh, cancer genome sequenced, back then he paid $100,000. Yeah. And right now, the personal genome is under 1000 Yeah. I'm not saying thanks for the BGI. The BGI is part of it, but it's co the collective effort. And a BGI scientist has said in five years it will cost you 100 bucks. <laughs> that, to me, is progress. Yeah. Well, we've reached our closing time, but oh. join me in thanking Professor Thank Solomon, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. And the book is available outside. It's obsolete. One, one last comment, which yes, Larry didn't say, is that he has a very long-standing National Committee connection. Yeah. He was on the tarmac when the ping pong team mm. landed. <laughs> <laughs> And was Is he in our photo and I was and I was chewed out by your founder, Alexander Eckstein, who came up to me and stood right in front of me and yelled and screamed at me for something I can't remember. And I was sitting there shaking and Dr. Richard Solomon, uh, who has had a role in Chinese American affairs, came up to me and said, Don't worry about it. He yells at everybody. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for coming. <laughs>